Thank you for joining our Debbie's Dream Foundation webinar series. Today's webinar is on immunotherapy with Dr. Daniel Kananatu. I'm Jackie Bello, Programs Manager for Debbie's Dream Foundation, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Channel Sponsor, Daiichi Thank You, Platinum Sponsor, Bristol Myers Squid, Gold Sponsors, Estelle's and Merck, Silver sponsor, Lily Oncology, and bronze sponsor, Genentech. First, I will share information about stomach cancer and Debbie's Dream Foundation. Then we'll hear a presentation on immunotherapy with Dr. Daniel Kananachi. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A discussion. You can type your questions throughout the presentation into the chat section that appears on the webinar menu. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation as time allows. And now here are some facts about stomach cancer. In 2019, it was estimated that more than 27,000 Americans would be diagnosed with stomach cancer each year. Many patients are asymptomatic during the early stages of stomach cancer, leading to a late diagnosis. Also, stomach cancer is on the rise for young adults. Debbie's Dream Foundation is dedicated to raising awareness, advancing funding for stomach cancer research, and providing education and support internationally to patients, families, and caregivers. Our ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can learn more by visiting our website at debbiesdream.org. Pictured here is Debbie Zumman, the founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation. Debbie was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. She had no risk factors and only vague symptoms. At the time, she was told her chance of being alive in five years was only 4%. She endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments and experienced many reoccurrences over nine and a half years. Unfortunately, Debbie passed away on December 23rd of 2017 at the age of 50 after a nine and a half year battle with cancer. She dedicated herself to helping others with stomach cancer by raising awareness and pro providing resources and education. Debbie founded DDF in April of 2009. As an organization, we will continue her important work and legacy. In a few short years, DDF has achieved many great milestones. We have 34 chapters across the US, including Canada and Germany. Our PrEP program helps patients their families and caregiver match with survivor and caregiver mentors using disease-specific criteria, including stage, biomarker, and location. We host educational webinars and symposia year-round, and our website contains in-depth information about stomach cancer. We have also provided $1 million in research grants to date and advocate each year during our Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Advocacy Day to add stomach cancer to the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. This past Advocacy Day was a huge success. We hosted 115 advocates, making this year our largest turnout yet. Due to the efforts of the foundation, our partners and our dedicated advocates, we helped secure continued funding in the amount of $110 million, a $20 million increase from last year. Here you can see some of our upcoming events. To learn more, you can visit our website under the heading Events. CDS is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on this slide are important phone numbers and email addresses you can use to contact our office and staff. We will now begin the presentation on immunotherapy with Dr. Daniel Kananachi. Dr. Kananachi is a gastrointestinal medical oncologist and the director of the gastrointestinal oncology program at the University of Chicago. He serves as an assistant director of translational research in the Comprehensive Cancer Center. In addition to his clinical practice, Dr. Kananachi is an active basic and clinical researcher, focusing on treatment of gastroesophageal cancers. His translational research has an overarching goal to validate and improve personalized treatment 
immunotherapy, and precision medicine. We'd like to thank Dr. Panachi for taking time out of the schedule today. And that, doctor, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to chat with you today. Um, I'm going to move forward. There we go. So I'm going to talk about gastroesophageal cancer and um, immunotherapy and its treatment for it. And I'll start off with some introductory slides just to follow up on what you just heard. In terms of epidemiology of the disease, um, gastric cancer and esophageal cancer, you can see their incidences there in terms of new cases diagnosed per year and deaths per year. And when you look at this um, globally, you can see that um, this is a significant health problem, a very common cancer and a high cause of cancer death. And when you see on the right there, if you look together at stomach and esophageal cancer, um, this is amongst the top uh, cancers in terms of incidence and mortality. When we talk about gastroesophageal cancer, we, we subdivide it into three main categories that you can see there, um, esophageal squamous cell cancer, esophagogastric junction adenocarcinoma, which is comprised of different subgroups within that. Um, these are the type 1, 2, and 3 Seward classification, uh, was named after a German surgeon, uh, basically talking about the anatomical landmarks um, with respect to these cancers, but overall, biologically, they are quite similar. And then gastric cancer proper, which is the remainder part of the stomach. Uh, in terms of reasons for getting these cancers, squamous cell cancer is associated with alcohol and, and tobacco use. Um, it's decreasing in incidence in, in the, the United States over time. Gastric cancer has been associated with exposures to things like H. pylori infection, which is a type of uh, bacterial infection, and other exposures like nitrosamines uh, found in deli meats. And because of these known exposures and uh, avoidance of these exposures or treatment of the H. pylori, the incidence of gastric cancer is also decreasing in incidence. On the other hand, these esophagogastric junction cancer tumors are increasing in incidence um, on the order of two or three hundred percent over the last decades. Um, it is associated with um, obesity, chronic reflux, heartburn, Barrett's esophagus, um, uh, diabetes, Caucasian, male, and Western diet. And so sort of some of those things uh, we can't avoid and other things are uh, associated with other medical uh, problems. So this is a, a, about two thirds of our practice would be seeing patients with this type of a gastroesophageal cancer as opposed to stomach cancer proper or esophageal squamous cell cancer. Together, we refer to gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma though to all of these together, the esophageal gastric junction adenocarcinoma and the stomach cancer adenocarcinoma because in the end, even though we do understand that they are different in terms of etiology, what caused them, um, their treatments are quite similar at this point. Um, over the years, we have determined subgroups within each of these uh, categories based on what they look like under the microscope or their biology, their, their molecular biology, their genetics. So this is a simplification of a very heterogeneous disease, lots of different subgroups within here. And we'll get into that when we talk about treatments because the treatments are evolving to catch up with that known understanding now. Unfortunately, we can summarize the, the treatment of metastatic disease of this, of this cancer type in one slide. Uh, and so there, there's m lots of room for improvement. And, and one thing to say is that a, a large proportion of patients are diagnosed at the outset with stage four disease um, at the first presentation. And that's because symptoms are vague or come on very suddenly at the point when the disease is already spread. Now, a proportion of patients do present before it has spread, and in, th in that case, stages one to three, the vast majority tend to be stage two and three. Um, after getting some form of, of treatment with chemotherapy or other agents, um, chemotherapy and radiation, um, and then curative intense surgery, 
cure is possible in those patients. In other words, patients do not have their cancer come back over a period of, of years afterwards. Uh, unfortunately, though, about just over half of those patients will still have recurrence despite our best therapies. And so overall, we are talking about either newly diagnosed stage four disease or recurrent stage four disease in a large proportion or majority of our patients. The, the treatment for these patients are considered palliative, meaning it's not curative. We don't know how to get rid of the cancer once and for all, once it has spread. But we have treatments that can, number one, improve symptoms from the cancer, and number two, um, increase survival time. Um, albeit after a period of time, each of these therapies will start losing their control, something we call disease resistance or, or chemotherapy resistance. So uh, classically, we have chemotherapies or cytotoxics, of which there are a number listed here, 5-FU, oxaliplatin or cisplatin, irinotecan, and various taxanes like paclitaxel or docetaxel. And a most recent oral version of a chemotherapy drug called TAS-102 or difluoridine to puracil are also known as Lonser. Um, so in addition to the chemotherapy, we've had a number of targeted therapies uh, approved, uh, three of them specifically listed here. And we're going to go through the data for each of these that support their usage here to put into context immunotherapy, which is the, the topic of this discussion. So we'll focus on HER2 which occurs in about 15% of gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma. So most of the talk is geared towards adenocarcinoma as opposed to squamous cell. I will point out a few things about squamous cell as we go along. And uh, the approval of an anti-HER2 therapy in the first-line setting um, for these patients in addition to chemotherapy. And then um, uh, for all patients, no specific biomarker as opposed to, say, HER2 positive. Um, this drug, ramucirumab, which um, inhibits blood vessel formation to the tumor, plus chemotherapy in the second-line setting. And then MSI high tumors, which is a specific genetic event, which occurs infrequently, but when it happens, uh, immunotherapy with pembrolizumab is very effective, and we'll show you that um, in the second-line setting or higher. And, and then in the third-line setting or higher, patients with expression of a protein called PDL1. Um, uh, which we'll talk about how we score it, but that's what combined positivity score of one or higher means. The incidence is about 60% of patients' tumors will have this, and they are eligible for pembrolizumab um, in the third line setting or higher. So we'll go over some of these data that support each of these approvals and when they happened. And we, when we talk about the benefit, we use a hazard ratio, which um, the lower the number below one, the more benefit it is. So um, in a randomized study, we can determine these numbers. In non-randomized studies, we cannot, and these are both approvals based on non-randomized data that I'll show you about. That's why they're conditionally approved based on future studies that need to confirm uh, the, the benefit in a, in a prospective uh, randomized fashion. So this uh, slide here is showing um, what we can expect in terms of outcomes with no therapy, best supportive care. Historically speaking, this was back in the time when um, there was really not a lot of treatment options available. And then over time with a number of different chemotherapy regimens all listed here and their acronyms down here, each of these letters stand for chemotherapy drugs, uh, <clears throat> in various combinations, all of those drugs I had listed on the prior slide. Two drug regimens in green, three drug chemotherapy regimens in orange, compared to best supportive care. And what is plotted here in months is the median overall survival time. And what that means is the time point at which 50% of patients are no longer alive and 50% of patients are still alive. That's all that that means. It's just a statistic and it doesn't mean or pinpoint what any one individual experience. There's a wide range around these numbers. Some, unfortunately, will be lower as an individual and some will be higher. But this is sort of gives a sense of what the median would be. Some other sort of landmark outcomes would be the one-year, two-year, and five-year overall survival rates. And as you can see, even with our best chemotherapy regimens, whichever one is chosen for first uh, treatment or first-line therapy, 
Um, we, there's still a lot of room for improvement, but it is certainly better than nothing. And it, we know that it can be palliative and improve symptoms, which is why it is considered a standard approach. In terms of targeted therapies, we know that HER2 therapy is uh, um, an improvement on um, the control. And that was found in this study that's called the TOGA study, which enrolled only patients with HER2 positive cancer. And it, in the dark purple was the outcome of patients who got just chemotherapy alone plus a placebo versus those who got trastuzumab plus chemotherapy. So the median survival was improved. When we look at a subgroup analysis of that study of patients that what we now call HER2 positive, because in this study, about a third of patients, actually we don't call HER2 positive at this time because we know that they don't drive benefit. We can see that the, the benefit amongst these patients was even higher. And then when we look at patients who have really high levels of HER2 expression, their outcomes, their median survivals approach one and a half years, which is far better than the, the standard sort of outcome of between 10 to 12 months, which is sort of a victory of targeted therapies for this cancer type. And so you can see here, um, compared to all comers with HER2 negative disease, as I showed on the prior slide, the outcomes um, now are improved in terms of median overall survival one year overall survival and other uh, landmark endpoints. And we can note that Debbie had HER2 positive disease and, and she benefited from Herceptin and uh, Trastuzumab and other um, targeted therapies towards HER2. Unfortunately, um, this, is that, this is that study I was just plotting and what it's showing here just for a high level uh, descript description is that it's survival was improved and it became a standard of care. Green means it was a positive study. Unfortunately, there have been other studies, both in the first line setting, which means the first treatment used in the newly diagnosed setting, or second line setting, which is the second type of chemotherapy used once the first one stops working, with various anti-HER2 drugs like lapatinib, pertuzumab, lapatinib in second line, or TDM1, cadzyla in the second line, and all of these studies, unfortunately, were negative. They had some signals that there could have been subgroups within um, the studies that could derive benefit, but overall, these studies were considered negative. So um, more work to do for HER2 uh, positive tumors. Switching gears to another type of drug, I mentioned earlier, ramucirumab or Cyramza, which is an anti-angiogenesis drug, meaning it, it, it inhibits blood vessel formation to the tumors. Um, we had positive studies in the second line setting with this drug. Every, every trial typically has a name that we refer to it as. So these were the REGARD study and the RAINBOW study. And you can see that survival was improved. Um, median survivals were improved statistically. And so these became approvals for either alone as a monotherapy you can treat with or better in combination with uh, standard chemotherapy where you can see that the outcomes are better compared to monotherapy. So this is a known standard option. In China, another um, drug that inhibits blood vessel formation called apatinib um, was positive in a phase three study, but in a follow-up study that was more global um, recently presented, um, it was not uh, considered a positive study. So there's some uh, discrepant data there. It's, it's not available here uh, to suffice it to say um, for patients. Uh, so moving and, and evaluating these blood vessel or anti-angiogenesis drugs to the first line setting, unfortunately, you can see a whole list here of multiple drugs, uh, multiple studies that were conducted with ramucirumab, bevacizumab, and aflibercept, all drugs in the same class that inhibit this anti-angiogenesis phenomenon. They were all, again, showing some signal to benefit, but overall not considered positive. And so these drugs are not used in the first line setting because of these negative studies. The big phase three studies are highlighted in, in red. The other ones are smaller phase two studies. So that brings us to here to summarize. We have a number of chemotherapy drugs. Um, a typical first line chemotherapy regimen would be 5-FU and platinum, fall fox chemotherapy second line regimens with the renotecan or taxane, third line regimens with the reverse or lawn surf and, and sequencing over time is sort of a standard approach with uh, HER2 positive cancers. 
we know that Herceptin trastuzumab in the first line setting is a standard approach. And then uh, ramucirumab in the second line setting with either arinotecan or taxane is a standard approach. And that's how we treat uh, stage four cancer. Until um, um, immunotherapy came along and we had some recent approvals a few years ago, and we'll talk about that now for the rest of the talk. This is again in the, in the context of having many targeted therapies and immunotherapy studies that have reported as negative, many of which I've shown you, and I'll show you the immunotherapy studies in the next slides. And so this is what is considered standard approach um, for treating our patients with stage four gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma. So what about these, uh, these approvals with this drug called pembrolizumab or Keytruda? So, and first let's just talk about what, what exactly it is to talk about immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is sort of a big uh, blanket term for any therapy really that will stimulate the immune system to attack the cancer. Now there's a subgroup or subclass of these immunotherapies that really um, have um, been the, the, the one that is referred to that has been having such success, and those are called checkpoint inhibitors, immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors, and of which there are uh, two uh, um, that are more prevalent and a number of others being investigated at, at this time. The most common one and the one that's sort of relevant to gastroesophageal cancer is this PDL1, PD1 pathway, and that, that this is a sort of a schema to show what exactly is going on here when we talk about immunotherapy. So if we have a collection of cancer cells, these cancer cells um, express on this MHC receptor abnormal proteins that are, you, that are part of the cancer but are, are not your normal self. They're altered from your normal self. And we have immune cells called T cells that come in and would recognize that cancer cell as being abnormal through that protein that was being expressed on its surface. What the cancer does to try and evade this response is to express a protein called PDL1, which when the T cell comes in and says, hey, this is abnormal through this, this, um, this interaction, the PD1 and PDL1 receptors bind to each other and turn off this T cell. So this acts like a force field for the cancer cells to evade our, uh, our own immune system, our own T cells. And so what this, this is referred to is a checkpoint. It's a checkpoint um, that basically has evolved in some of our normal cells even to, to evade autoimmunity so that our own T cells don't attack our own cells. And cancer cells have hijacked this process to evade our immune system. So what are these immune checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapies, they're antibodies that look like this, little Ys, that bind specifically to either PD-1 or PD-L1. Um, there are different drugs. Some drugs bind to PD-1, some drugs bind to PD-L1, which is the protein that sits on the cancer, and blocks this interaction. So they're checkpoint inhibitors. And when this happens, then the T cell can then come in and kill this cancer cells again, which is what we want to do. So that's sort of the background of what immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors do and, and what we're looking at here. So the revolutionary um, uh, study was this study that looked at a subgroup of tumors that are called MSI high, microsatellite instable high tumors. So this is a, a genetic event that occurs in only a very small subset of cancers. For gastroesophageal cancer, it's only about 2 to 3% of all cancers. But the relevance here is that um, this study looked at tumors, uh, specifically 86 tumors, patients with these tumors that had this finding. And you can see that it wasn't specific to any tumor type. It was all kinds of different cancers, of which gastroesophageal cancer was one of them. But this was the makeup of the patients um, uh, uh, in, in this study. And they were all given this drug, uh, pembrolizumab, um, and the, the findings were pretty remarkable where um, this is the survival time plotted in months of every patient, every line as a patient. And you can see that some patients were um, doing very well even at two years after starting therapy, at which point the study um, was, was to take patients off study after getting to that point. And you can see that patients that even were still doing well and alive 
several years even after uh, coming off the treatment. And so this was a pretty remarkable finding. And some other no notable things are um, when we talk about survival curves, where normally when we follow a survival curve over time, this line unfortunately continues to fall. But with immunotherapy in MSI high tumors, you can see that the survival curve is actually reaching a plateau and that there's a percentage of patients that appear to have long-term survival. So this was very revolutionary, very um, exciting, and very uh, remarkable to, to notice this for patients. And these two figures here are called waterfall plots. And what they're showing is that, and they're color-coded by the tumor type that was enrolled, the shrinkage rate or growth, in some cases, you know, unfortunately it doesn't work in everybody. In some cases it actually grew, but in many cases, and in some of them, complete responses, 100% shrinkage or response with the treatment. And then after following for a longer period of time, some patients converted to becoming responders even after the, uh, compared to before. So this was all very remarkable and actually, let, and as you know, I mentioned that gastroesophageal cancer was was made up in this, um, and unfortunately, it's not a really common finding, but when we find it, this is the time to use immunotherapy, and the response rates are exceedingly high. Um, as a background, first-line chemotherapy with Folfox has a response rate of about 40 to 45 percent, so for that this 60 percent, um, which was seen throughout all tumor types and, and within gastroesophageal cancer is quite remarkable in patients who had already failed prior therapies. All of these patients were pre-treated and had no uh, other available therapies available to them, and they had this outcome, which is very, very outstanding. So this uh, result led to a pan-tumor approval of pembrolizumab for patients that harbored tumors with MSI high in them and it wasn't even a randomized study. It was a, it was compared to historical controls, but it was so remarkable that this led to um, a, a well-deserved approval for pembrolizumab for all solid tumors, including gastroesophageals that harbor MSI high tumors. So, what about patients who don't have uh, MSI high tumors? Uh, you know, the other 98% of tumors. Uh, this is the the study landscape. Of, of various trials that have been done to sort of guide us as to where and when we should even consider giving immunotherapy for these patients. The top line is our studies. Each of these are, are listed studies um, um, that have been completed. And in the bottom, there's a whole bunch of studies that are actually still ongoing in the first line setting. Um, after a period of time on chemo is called maintenance therapy. There's one study there. And then um, in the second line study, there's a bunch of studies. And in the third line or higher setting, there are a bunch of studies. So we're going to focus on some of these just to give you an overview of why we practice the way we do today and maybe what's coming in the future. But first, I'm going to just, again, talk about MSI high because I think that's the most important one. And looking at the Keynote 62, 61, and 59 studies across three different lines of therapy, what a, a sub, an analysis showed, um, these were the, the survival curves um, in the, the study as the whole or something we call the intention to treat analysis. That's all studies and all patients enrolled in the study. And then looking at just the subgroup of patients who had MSI high tumors, which again are a small subset, only seven of the 259 or you know 30 of the 500 and et cetera or 37 of the 600 in these studies. But of those patients, you can see they do so much better than the rest of the patients with immunotherapy. And in the uh, this Keynote 59 study was a single arm study that there was no randomized control, but in 61 and 62, there were randomized controls to chemotherapy alone, which is the control arm. And in red, you see the chemotherapy outcomes in the MSI high tumors, and then you see the outcomes with immunotherapy, and you can see these huge discrepant benefit. So there's clear benefit in all lines of therapy, and at the moment, the approval is in second line, but we strongly consider using this. Many of us have already converted to this. It's just a matter of time before we see an approval there, probably, um, to first line setting because it's just um, so much better of an outcome. But what about the other patients in these studies, and we're going to focus about that now. So um, 
we talk about these studies and um, we'll, we'll focus on um, a few points here just at high level and if there are questions I'm happy to answer them at the end. But in the, in the, the squares are, are referring to whether or not the study is considered positive or negative. Uh, green are positive studies, red are negative studies. And so the Attraction 2 study, which was the first randomized study in the third line setting with nivolumab, another uh, one of the PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors, showed benefit in all patients enrolled. Now, this study was only done in Asia, um, and so this approval of nivolumab Opdivo was only in Asian countries, not in the U.S. to date. Uh, a follow another study that reported just right after that was Keynote 59. This was a study. Um, a single arm study, there was no randomized control. And pa there are two lines here showing patients that had PDL1 positive tumors or PDL1 negative tumors. And the PDL1 positive tumors did slightly better. And this led to an approval of pembrolizumab or Keytruda only in the third line setting or higher, but only in PDL1 positive tumors. Then there were a bunch of other studies, unfortunately, that I've all read out as being negative. And a few points about them are, there are some signals of benefit in some subgroups, but the problem is, is that for approvals to occur, um, that they have to be in sort of the original trial design as opposed to unplanned, what we call retrospective subgroup analyses that, you know, are subject to biases and to random chance that it could be positive as opposed to the, the prospectively controlled study. So looking at these survival curves, we can see some interesting phenomenon. And the one phenomenon that sort of I, I've coined is called a yin-yang plot. And that's because the curves cross. You can see that the curves are crossing here. What that means is that early on, patients in the, in the immunotherapy arm, pembrolizumab arm, Keytruda, are doing worse than chemotherapy. They're, they're, they're having a worse survival. But at, at, at this inflection point that occurs at about eight or nine months, you see now that other patients, different patients, are doing better than the control. And so we saw this again in our first line study, the exact same phenomenon where the, at the beginning, it seems to be detrimental to give this drug compared to chemotherapy. But then later on, other patients are showing that it's be more beneficial than, than chemotherapy. And another study with a different drug, a Valumab, a PDL1 inhibitor, which was done in the maintenance setting after three months of chemo, patients were then randomized to a Valumab, a PDL1 in in inhibitor, or to chemotherapy. And again, we saw that yin yang plot. And um, patients were doing worse at the beginning, but then later on, we saw other patients that would do better. So it's our duty to try and find out who these patients are to spare them from this because we first want to do no harm and we have better therapies for them, but also find out who these patients are so that we can give it to them when it's appropriate. And that's what our task has been and, and continues to be over the next months and years. Now, one of those things I already mentioned was MSI high. MSI high tumors are in this group. And so we know that already. But what else could be there? Well, we know that cutoffs of PDL1 are important. I should just back up and say this study is looking at CPS PDL1 positive tumors. They had to be one or higher to be eligible here. And then we were still seeing this survival. Same thing here was in patients with PDL1 one or higher. Here, this was in all comers, but they did not show any benefit in uh, looking at PDL1 by tumor positivity scoring, which is different than combined positivity scoring, as I'll go into in the next few slides. Um, so, but one thing we have noted is that if you make the cutoff higher, instead of looking at a score of one or higher, making it 10 or higher, we seem to be able to enrich for patients who do better and spare this, this yin part of the curve. There's not people looking like they're doing worse than chemotherapy, which is a, a step in the right direction. However, and unfortunately, in other studies, where we looked at CPS 10 or higher, we still saw this detriment in the, the patients getting immunotherapy, even in 10 or higher. And same thing here um, in this Keynote 181 uh, study of adenocarcinoma, there was no survival benefit in CPS 10 or higher in adenocarcinoma patients. So it's 
it's it's we know that we can um, enrich for benefit by by making that score higher, but maybe it should be even higher yet to really spare patients that aren't going to do better or find other biomarkers that might help us to really narrow down who's going to benefit and who's actually not going to benefit from these therapies. One of the hypotheses is that the immunotherapy can actually stimulate the cancer to grow faster, something that's called hyperprogression. And so, you know, that, there's a lot of debate and controversy about that. And so the one study that actually refutes that hypothesis is this attraction two study where these patients here getting basically placebo. They were not getting any therapy at all. That was the randomized control arm. And if there was truly hyper progression, meaning nivolumab was not only not working, but it was making the cancer grow faster than it otherwise would have, we would have seen the yin-yang plot here too. We would have seen this drop and then crossing, but we do not see the drop and crossing here in this study, which is the only study we have that is compared to a randomized placebo control. All the other studies here have a randomized chemo control arm, and chemo we know is effective. And so my, my conclusion is that it's not that the immunotherapy is making these patients' cancers grow faster. It's just not as good as effective therapy in each of these studies, and it makes the immunotherapy look worse in a subgroup of patients. In other patients, the, it's the reverse, of course, like I mentioned. So that's the, it's not hyperprogression. So um, this was in all comers. Tumor positivity scoring did not enrich for benefit, and it was compared to placebo. The Keno 59 study was in all comers, but it was only shown to be beneficial and approved in CPS tumors one or higher. And this was a non-randomized study compared to just historical controls. And then this Javelin 300 study, which was again a value map, the same drug that was looked at in the first line Javelin 100 study, was in all comers, no selection by PDL1 um, um, criteria, but in subgroup analysis, TPS scoring still didn't enrich for benefit. So um, we have just these two studies that have led to approvals in Asia with nivolumab or in the US with pembrolizumab. And um, one might sort of conclude that, um, that nivolumab and pembrolizumab being PD-1 inhibitors might be better than PD-L1 inhibitors. Um, but I would argue that it's because this study was negative because it actually used a control arm of active therapy of chemo whereas this was comparing to nothing, and this was comparing to essentially nothing. It was a historical control. And so, you know, until proven otherwise, I, I would imagine that there will still be some patients who are better served with chemo compared to immunotherapy, even though it's approved in these patients. Um, and we need to sort of make sure that that's well understood. What support do I have for that? Well, there are meta-analyses that compare PD-1 inhibitors versus PD-L1 inhibitors. And as you can see here, there's no real differences in response rate or toxicity rates and overall survival. And so um, these are some drugs, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, Opdivo and Keytruda that are PD-1 inhibitors. These are PD-L1 inhibitors, atezolizumab, dervalumab, avalumab, and thousands of patients compared here, and there's really no big difference. So for me, I, until proven otherwise, there's not a main or major difference between these drugs, and they all work very similarly, and they all work very well in the subgroup of patients, some of which we know, some of which we're still trying to determine and narrow down. A few last words about um, PDL1 testing, because this is an important thing that you come across, and that is I've been talking about combined positivity score as opposed to tumor positivity score, TPS. Tumor positivity score is basically the percentage of cells, all the tumor cells that have PDL1 expression. The combined positivity score is not looking at PDL1 staining of only the tumor cells, but also all the white blood cells that might be around as well, lymphocytes, macrophages, over the total number of tumor cells. So this is a special scoring method, and a tumor is considered positive only if the PDL1 uh, formula here is one or higher. So um, there's a specific antibody that the FDA has approved in connection with this scoring with pembrolizumab, and that's listed here, this 2,2-C3 farm assay. 
So as an example of why this is important comparing CPS and TPS is that this is an example of a tumor. This is a tumor, all of the tumor. This is a, 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 a biopsy that was taken. And you can see the big cells are talking about tumor cells and the little cells are talking about inflammatory white blood cells. And the red means it's positive staining and the, the no, no color means it's not staining for pd one And what you're seeing here is heterogeneity. Some tumor cells are staining, some are not. Some immune cells are staining, some are not. This is very common. And so ultimately when you start scoring this sample, you will get a score. And this score here in this example is an eight. So it's a positive score based on one or higher, but as an example, it would be considered negative if we were using a cutoff of 10 or higher, like in those subgroup analyses from all those studies. Now, in the other extreme, a score that's zero, um, well, no cells are staining, then of course that tumor would be PDL1 negative. Now, there will be a situation where tumor cells are not staining positive, but immune cells are staining positive. And as long as the score, which incorporates all of this, is above one, this could still be called a positive CPS score. In contrast, if we look at TPS scoring, TPS scoring can be concordant with CPS scoring in some scenarios, like if it's completely negative both ways, then they can be concordant. If, if it's completely positive both ways, then it could be concordant. But here, there could be discordance where the tumor cells are negative and you get a negative TPS score, but the immune infiltrating cells are positive, giving you a positive CPS score. So this patient would be getting immunotherapy if it was scored by CPS, but it would be considered negative if it was scored by TPS. So this is some details and nuances that we have to pay attention to as physicians so we know what we're getting into. And, and each of the, the drugs, nivolumab, evalumab, pembrolizumab, and the studies, the names that they call their studies, use different antibodies, diagnostic antibodies to score PDL1, different scoring systems, and they have different cutoffs of what they call positive. And because of that, there's a different incidence of what is considered a positive tumor. And if you're using CPS with a one or higher, about 60% of patients' tumors are positive. But if you're using a TPS scoring with this assay, it can be as low as only 10% of patients having a positive tumor. So there is clear differences between these mechanisms. And, and then there's therefore differences in um, their performance. So when I put here good negative predictive value, it means if your score is zero, the chances of you dividing, deriving benefit from immunotherapy is very low, unfortunately. But these ones, if you're negative, it doesn't really mean that because there still could be immune infiltrate that there and it's not being captured in this assay. So that's my way of belaboring the point that it really you have to pay attention to how is it being scored and that we need to know that this is the only assay approved by the FDA to be used for uh, selection by PDL1 um, uh, testing. So as an example of this, the, this Keynote 61 study, which was the second line study comparing pembrolizumab and the survival in green versus chemotherapy and the survival in purple or red there. And you can see again the yin-yang plot. What we see here and what is often shown is the subgroup of patients who were CPS one or higher, which was a subgroup of the total that were enrolled. What you don't see very often is the group of patients who were CPS zero this part of the study, patients who were zero, this you can see were doing worse and dying more frequently and earlier than the chemo arm. And this led to early termination of this arm of the study. So patients that are CPS zero were doing worse than chemotherapy. And we also have to keep in mind that this chemotherapy arm was just with Taxol, Paclitaxel alone. And we know now that from the rainbow study that Paclitaxel plus Cyramza, Ramucirumab, is better than Paclitaxel alone. And that survival curve would be more like along this trajectory and much better than even Paclitaxel alone. So we are not doing our patients any favors by giving them immunotherapy when we have much better options for them if their CPS is zero. Good negative predictive value. On the other hand, if you're positive, it doesn't mean for sure you're going to benefit but it's at least going to help to predict who would be amongst those who benefit.
And then this is, as I mentioned earlier, that subgroup, if you take out the patients from this hole that were CPS 10 or higher, that's about 100 of the 400 patients, then they seem to really do better. So the higher the level of CPS, the better, essentially. The incidence, just for your understanding, is about a third of patients are CPS negative, about half of patients are between 1 and 10, and about just under 20% are above 10. So that sort of gives you a sense of what the incidence of all this is. So it's our job to continue to find patients who won't do well, things that predict that they won't do well, like PDL1 negative, um, not feeling well, not having strength, uh, what we call poor performance status, or a high burden of disease and symptoms. These are all things that predict that immunotherapy is not going to really help. On the other hand, we know that MSI high tumors, good performance status, higher PDL1 expression, etc., low burden of disease, will help predict those who will do best. And if we just treat everybody, though, we get these sort of yin-yang curves because we're getting an average of those who don't do well and those who do well, and we get this sort of average curve. So it's really just math, as you can see here. So uh, to summarize then and finalize the talk, um, we have a bunch of negative studies here in red for adenocarcinoma. We have these two studies in the third line setting. One is with Opdivo nivolumab in Asia only. One is in all comers. One is in third-line setting um, PDL1 positive tumors with pembrolizumab keytruda. And some other things that I didn't mention is that squamous cell of the esophagus has its own study, Keynote 181, where um, it included both adenocarcinoma of the esophagus and squamous cell of the esophagus, but the benefit was really only observed in patients with squamous cell cancers that were 10 or higher, and that led to an approval by the FDA recently for these patients. Then uh, the study with Opdivo, nivolumab attraction three, was done and it was in only patients with squamous cell esophagus in the second line. And that recently, like last month, led to approval for all patients with esophageal squamous cell in the second line setting or higher. So there are options there for squamous cell patients in the second line. Um, you can see there are a number of studies still ongoing um, in this uh, in the first line setting with various therapies that we wait, await, um, and uh, we, we look forward to seeing those results. Um, you can see that um, some may be sooner rather than later. Now, the COVID issue may have delayed that somewhat um, in terms of the readouts of some of these studies, but hopefully we won't have to wait too long and we can try and pinpoint who should be and who should not be getting therapy in the first line set setting. Um, and then the, there are some really large studies with thousands of patients enrolled in them. So we should really hopefully learn a little bit more on how to move these therapies earlier. There's also a couple of studies being looked at in HER2 positive patients. These are for HER2 negative patients. And again, uh, we look forward to seeing if we can move um, immunotherapy to earlier lines of set uh, therapy as opposed to in later lines. This is my last slide, and it sort of just summarizes all of the different um, standard options available, chemo and um, um, targeted therapies and immunotherapies, and the subgroups of the tumor. So these days, we really have to look at the biology of the cancer. Is it HER2 positive or negative? Is it microsatellite stable or not? Is it pdl one positive or not? And that dictates the trajectory of what we would do through, through the different lines of therapy to try and keep the cancer as controlled as possible minimize side effects as much as possible, and to improve quality of life as best as possible. Um, some things that we would consider doing outside of the book right now um, would be to move immunotherapy earlier, because remember, it's only approved in the second line setting right now for MSI high, and only in the third line setting for PDL1 positives by the one cutoff. But because of the data, particularly for MSI high, it's so strong that many of us have started moving it earlier, as I mentioned before. Um, and even for some other patients, super selected patients that could derive benefit earlier than the third line setting, and that's uh, to be determined. And uh, we hope with all those studies that are, are pending that we will get there. So I will stop there and sort of my phrase in all of my work that I do is that we try to give the right therapy to the right patient at the right time point and immunotherapy is not immune to that concept. As you can see here, it's not the right thing for, for many patients, but it is for some.
and we need to find out more um, how to better direct these therapies. So I'm happy to take some questions um, if there are any at this point. Thank you for sharing with us today. We re did receive some questions during your presentation. Um, the first question, uh, my mother has stomach cancer and also has an autoimmune disease. Is immunotherapy still an option for her? This is a great and important question. Um, all of those studies and all, most studies we do um, have excluded patients with known baseline autoimmune diseases, which include uh, lupus, um, autoimmune hepatitis, autoimmune colitis, like ulcerative colitis, and, and rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, multiple, um, multiple sclerosis, MS. Um, and so the reason for that is because, as I mentioned, um, one, one of the mechanisms of our normal cells to evade our immune system and stop autoimmunity are through these checkpoints. And, and so by releasing that checkpoint and blocking it, we can make our auto, we can create autoimmunity in patients who never had it before, or in patients who already have it, make them much worse. And so the idea there was that if we already know a patient has autoimmunity, it's probably not a, a good idea to, to, to do that. Um, unless there's really no other choices. Now, that said, we have done that. There are some reports that it can be attempted, but the risk of getting autoimmunity is much higher than somebody who doesn't have pre-existing autoimmunity. But again, after discussion of potential risks and benefits um, with your doctor and other options, so if there are other options, those would probably be preferred at the moment. But if there weren't any other options, then you know my preference has been you know, to discuss this with my patient and their families and say, you know, there is a high risk of this, but it's not guaranteed that it could exacerbate your autoimmunity. And we already know what's going to happen from this cancer. And if we're willing to accept the risks, then then we can try it, you know, and but at the same time, really know what you're getting into. There's no right or wrong answer, but um, it, it is a, something that we all struggle with in, in the clinic when we do have this issue. Great. Um, the second question, I've noticed changes in my skin after treatment. Is this normal? Uh, after immunotherapy treatment, um, you, you can see some changes. One of the autoimmune issues is that you can get a rash. Um, other people, another autoimmune phenomenon is called vitiligo, where, you, you know, the pigment in your skin cells can diminish and it turns white. Um, I'm not sure what you're, what's changing in your skin, but those could be some, some um, potential issues. Chemotherapy also, if it's the questions about chemotherapy or even target therapies, they, they can also cause skin changes. Um, inevitably, any chemotherapy, um, it, 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 as much as we'd like it to be targeted to cancer cells, it can't distinguish between normal cells and cancer cells that are dividing rapidly, and so we're susceptible to some side effects. And even immunotherapy, as you've heard, it's, it, it also is susceptible to side effects, um, even though it's targeted. Uh, another question that came in kind of related to that. Can immunotherapy side effects be managed the same way as chemotherapy side effects? Immunotherapy side effects, which are typically, um, you know, something that are causing autoimmunity um, in some fashion, are actually treated a little bit differently. So uh, in addition to stopping the therapy, which which would be not unique, we do that in any situation. If we know whatever therapy is happening, causing something, we would stop that. But in, in terms of immunotherapy, if we're convinced it's an autoimmune issue, then typically what one uses is steroids to suppress the immune system. Now we've revved it up, and now we want to try and turn it off a little bit. Um, if that doesn't work, then there are other sort of anti-immune or, anti um, or immunosuppressant drugs that can help to mitigate these side effects. But sometimes, unfortunately, it should be noted that sometimes these are, are lethal and, and can cause death. Typically, one of them is pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lungs and can cause you know, shortness of breath. And, and, if we, and if it can't be reversed, then that can lead to big problems. So it's not common but it should be recognized that these are potential side effects. Okay. Uh, and one last question. What questions should I ask my doctor when deciding if immunotherapy is the best course of treatment? Um, you should talk to them about 
some of the molecular findings that we were we were, I was trying to point out. Um, there are some genetic findings, like MSI high is a very important one. So you'd want to know what your status is if you're MSI high or not, which we would call microsatellite stable or MSS. Majority of patients are MSS, remember. Um, your PDL1 score, which will be helpful to uh, know uh, if you're eligible for the therapy. And remember, I said one or higher is eligible in the third line setting, but the higher, the better, really. And um, and uh, then they can have a conversation with you as to when it's uh, when it's appropriate and if it's appropriate. And then I should also finally mention that there are many studies out there now looking to crack the code to see. Remember, all of these studies are immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitor alone, just one by itself. There are many studies looking at combinations with other things, whether it's other other checkpoint inhibitors or other immune modulating agents or chemo or antiangiogenesis drugs or other target therapies. And so studies are always encouraged because then we can learn more and see if that's the way to do it. And the, of course, the patient that enrolls in that study would derive the benefit if that was to be true. So, uh, but in the meantime, it's the standard would be as, as I showed you. Unfortunately, we're out of time for more questions. Dr. Kanaji, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you again to our sponsors, title sponsor, Daiichi Sankyo, platinum sponsor, Bristol Myers with gold sponsor, Estelle's and Merck, silver sponsor, Lily Oncology, and bronze sponsor, Genentech. To view any of our recorded webinars, please visit our lecture library. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in.